we're having our event on compliance with cocktails. I have a few folks joining with me. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm, I'm Brian Kordelski. I run the data and analytics uh, sales team over here at Prolifics. And we are uh, focused today on compliance, CCPA and GDPR. I've got a few speakers that will be joining me today and you'll see them up on both on camera and they have several parts of this presentation. The first one is our, our, our risk and compliance czar, Ron Davis. Ron Davis is uh, the Director of Information Governance and Data Privacy. Uh, he will be kind of talking through the overall process for compliance and then we will be joined by a customer who we've known for a long time, Karen Jackson, who is the uh, Manager of Corporate Applications at ABS, and ABS is the American Bureau of Shipping. Uh, Karen is responsible for the GRC applications over there globally, and her practice includes data governance, enterprise modernization, automation, and data warehousing. Uh, we've been working with Karen for quite some time on both uh, the GDPR and CCPA types of applications, and Karen will be sharing some of her war stories throughout the process. So thank you all for joining us. I hope you brought a cocktail. Um, we look forward to having this conversation with you and please feel free to put as many questions as you want into the chat box. We have audience participation at the end that we'll be sharing some information uh, and having a conversation with you. So let's get started. Ron, over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Brian, and, and happy Friday Eve to everyone. And uh, I'm going to stick with my Pellegrino water because I've got to be able to talk and think. So uh, I'm sticking with Pellegrino for now. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Brian, go ahead. Next slide, please. I wanted to start off just uh, level setting a little bit about uh, while the data privacy concerns and laws are, are sweeping across the globe, I wanted to bring it a little bit closer to home in this session and talk a little bit uh, about the data privacy, um, the state of data privacy um, among the states throughout the US. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail on this map, but the point behind this is to highlight the fact that uh, the, the various states, as you see in the different colors here, are all at various stages of the legislative bill process. And uh, as you see in the bright red, there are actually three states that have already passed um, their data privacy uh, legislation. Um, CCPA being the California one, and then of course Nevada and Maine. Uh, and as you see in the other colors, there's, there's a number of states that have uh, the bills going into the committee and to the cross chamber. Uh, in, as a part of just going through the process uh, toward being signed. And the point behind this is simply to say that in addition to the global aspect, such as GDPR and Canada's PEPIDA version of uh, privacy, all of these laws are kind of coming through at, at different times, going to hit at different points in time, and actually are going to contain various uh, different aspects and uh, privacy law regulations. Okay, next slide, Brian. A few key points that uh, I like to highlight just to make sure that uh, we level set and make sure everybody's aware of some what we have found to be pretty critical items as we've, we've uh, worked with a number of customers on both GDPR and CCPA privacy. First one being uh, the fact that yes, the, the CCPA still is to be enforced effective July 1st. Uh, a lot of people were wondering if with the COVID and the, the global pandemic, would that cause things to be backed up? And the answer is no, it is still to be enforced uh, July 1st of this year. The next one is uh, the privacy concerns as a result of the pandemic have actually elevated a bit largely due to the work from home. About 90% of the organizations, according to IAP, uh, the International Association of uh, Privacy Professionals, about 90% of organizations have put in place privacy, or excuse me, policies requiring remote working. So that does open the door and that does expand risk relative to, to data privacy. And the last uh, point of consideration is the fact that CCPA does introduce a real important point here 
uh, under the breach notification statute revision. And what it is, it opens the door and, and provides the private right of action for providers or consumers to take litigation action. All right, so that's a real important point to drive home is that now uh, through this uh, statute and this revision, the CCPA now opens the door so that if a company has a breach, then, and it's a million records, then each record of that breach could open the door for individual litigation or class action litigation. That's a very important point that I wanted to, to, uh, to raise. Okay, Ryan, next slide. So in addition to the states going through their own version, global aspect of, of privacy, there's a lot of unknown out there, but there is some known, but there's even more unknown. So how do we deal with this unknown? And I wanna highlight five areas that we at Prolifix have, uh, have put together an overall framework and roadmap to uh, accommodate the five core um, uh, capabilities that we consider to be functional and, and primary, regardless of how the laws ultimately uh, are, are evolved, whether it's global, whether it's US-based or otherwise. And these five make up the, the fundamentals of data privacy, such as discovery and mapping. You've got to understand what holdings you have. You've got to understand where your data is at, who has access to which data, and is that uh, appropriate and, and legal under the, the particular privacy laws. The second one is records of processing. So we've got to understand what are we doing with this data, this sensitive or private data or personal data? What are our activities and processing doing with the data? How are we handling that? Are we selling any? Are we moving it to third-party processors? If we are, then are those third-party processors contracted appropriately with us under the privacy laws? The third one being the subject access request. This is you and I. This is the consumer or the uh, citizen that has access and rights now to uh, manage and to to uh, determine how their data is going to be used by a particular organization. You'll hear this referenced as a DSAR or a data subject access request. So that fundamental capability is core as well. The next one, of course, being the security and the governance aspect. How do we manage that data in our processes? How do we move that data from point to point? Do we, do we delete that data when it's reached its end of life? And if we delete that data, do we discard? And is that data truly gone? And is that risk associated with that piece of data gone as well? And last but not least, and is the breach aspect. And while the DSAR or the subject access request has been getting a lot of attention recently, the breach aspect has now, because of the new statute under CCPA, the breach aspect is now getting considerable attention as well. So um, we, we've included that as a, one of our five core functional capabilities that we recommend companies put in place even with the obscure and the unknowns of the privacy laws. If you can do these five things, then you'll be able to accommodate probably about 90 to 95% of the privacy uh, requirements and legislations that, that do evolve. Okay, Brian, next slide, please. Hey, Ron, you're, you're tracking really well. I know, uh, I know you're not uh, hitting the sauce too hard because you're ripping through this pretty quickly. Just a few questions for you here. Um, we don't have to do all this at once, right? July 1st is coming up in just a few weeks. The first uh, uh, audits are going to start coming up after that. Um, you know, can you just talk a little bit? You're, you're, like I said, you're great on time. Talk a little bit about the fact that customers don't have to consume all of this right out of the gate, that they can start in specific areas to get going. That's correct, Brian. And, and where we oftentimes 
will recommend starting is in that discovery and mapping so that we understand where we're at in terms of our data assets and our data holdings. Where does the risk lie? Do we have data that is, is in a particular system or in a particular area that is highly sensitive and is it used in a particular manner that could present elevated risk to us? So of these five, we typically say that you can't manage or govern or mitigate risk of something that you don't know you have. All right. So step one and and in a phased approach would be that discovery or mapping. Now, in the next slides, I'll get into the approach that we use to uh, to, to step into and step through uh, mitigating risk through the discovery and um, the data uh, mapping. All right, and go ahead, Brian, to the next slide. We take a, uh, at Prolifics, we take a, a top-down and bottom-up approach. At ABS, we started, and Karen can elaborate on this more uh, as we move through this time, this webinar, but at ABS, we started with a top-down approach. And the reason we at Prolifics like to start with a top-down approach is because at with that top-down approach, we can identify through collaborative meetings, review sessions, some assessment activities, we can identify um, rather quickly and cost-effectively where some risk levels lie uh, within your organization. For example, at ABS, within a couple weeks and a series of meetings and and workshops, we were able to identify about 20 risks, 20 potential risks within their environment. And that's by, with, with no software, you know, no large capital outs expenses, but, but a very focused um, effort with workshops and, and meetings and, and good Q&A um, processes in place that we were able to identify and uncover where those risks are, okay? now. The next slide, Brian, please. The next thing we did was we took that top down, um, that risk output, and we said, all right, Karen and her executive team, along with her legal counsel, we said, all right, what do these things mean to ABS in terms of risk to our business? Because privacy is just all about risk. There, there is no one answer for a privacy solution. There is no software, there, there, there is no process, there is no one solution. Every company interprets privacy risk differently and they're willing to accept or not various levels of risk. So what we did was we took that top down piece and said, here Karen and your executive team and their legal counsel, here are the risks. Then Karen and team decided that, you know what, those risks represent enough exposure to our company that we now need to do a bottom-up approach. The key point though here in the top-down is that in that top-down approach, we have had customers that say, you know what, we've gone far enough with the top-down. We see where the risk is well enough that we can make a, a, an educated decision on how we want to manage our privacy concerns at that point. So what we've done is we've come in and in, in, in a rather rapid, cost-effective manner, we've provided very valuable insight and, and the critical decisions were able to be made by those organizations at that point. Now, Karen and team, uh, they saw the risk so that they decided to, uh, to let us help them go from a bottom-up perspective now so that we're now actually electronically and to some degree automated fashion discovering the data, the sensitive data, the anomalies, where the risk lies very, very precisely, very broad within their company, yet very focused and precisely exactly where these pieces of data are, every location of that, what they're used for, who has access to them, et cetera. And, and I think Karen's gonna elaborate a little bit on some of the findings a little bit on that bottom up. Go ahead, Brian, to the next slide, please. Karen, yeah, you want to jump in here since, uh, since Ron's calling you out before we get to the next section? Sure. 
So we had very reluctant executives. They don't think that, that they have risk. So we, our CIO, who I'm on her team, we got uh, approval to spend a limited amount of budget to actually do a, a, an assessment, as Ron was saying. And that assessment highlighted <clears throat> the risks that ABS had even before we looked at any code, any data whatsoever. So I think it was a very good first step and that was used and presented to executives to get budget for the next year. And we were in a very bad t downturn, but that's one of the areas where we got budget. Excellent. So the, at that, thanks Karen. So at that point, then, we, then we took the top down as Karen said, and the bottom up and able to then bring all of that insight together and then make very comprehensive uh, and, and very complete assessments on how we're going to now mitigate that risk, all right, and prioritize those steps to mitigate the risk and implement uh, the privacy uh, solution itself so that if and when we get a request, how do we manage that request? What pieces of data do we need to go to? Uh, and so forth. So we now have a very complete picture given the top down and the bottom up approaches. Okay, next slide, Brian. And uh, in, in this slide, it's, it, it represents now the fact that a real important point, while this is a bit of an eye chart, you don't need to squint and look at everything. I just have a few points here I want to make out because this is really where Karen and her leadership team took this to another level. They said, all right, privacy and the GDPR is critical to our environment. We realize that we have risk. We know where a lot of that risk is. We've looked at the data, but you know what? Privacy is not a revenue generator. We, we don't gain a lot of business value. We mitigate risk, we avoid uh, reputational damage perhaps, but how do we then take those learnings from uh, the compliance and privacy work that we did and how do we turn that into advancing our data governance solutions and our practice? And how do we become much better as an organization at managing our data assets? So while stepping through the, the, the data privacy work, we, we invoked this, this balanced governance framework and then captured that compliance information and we're able to, and it's an ongoing thing, but we're able to now leverage the value from the compliance in, an whole, in a whole nother manner besides just addressing the compliance risk. So we've leveraged that knowledge and information now to move her data, Karen's data governance and data warehousing efforts, move forward to the next levels. So for example, we identified through the data analysis and the scanning and profiling, we identified data quality issues. We identified um, various data anomalies, data assets that could be leveraged. We identified processes perhaps processes that could be improved. And we identified people and resources who had knowledge and insight in various pieces of the business and data that we would not have been aware of had we not gone through the compliance. And so we captured all of that insight and, and structured that into a data governance program that Karen and team are now able to leverage going forward. And that, that kickstarts and that progresses their data maturity and now evolve it into more, maybe more of a data strategy and so forth. So the bottom line point there is to simply say that as you're going through your compliance efforts, there's a lot more rich information and insight you can harvest from those efforts than just meeting uh, the compliance and privacy uh, risk type work or solution, okay? Excellent, Ron, thank you very much. Uh, stick around because I'm sure we have uh, many more questions for you and we're gonna jump right in uh, and get to the interview portion of this. Um, I know, I've known Karen for quite some time when we went through this process for the assessment. I know 
you just went through a lot of detail, but in essence, we, we, we developed an assessment. We worked with the customer to go from both the bottoms down and the top, you know, tops down and bottoms up approach. We focused on the data and we did a lot of interviewing, I know, with the business. And I, I can tell you, as, uh, as much as I love Karen, I know she can be uh, very pushed towards the goals and driving us as a partner towards getting this achievement done. And I was very happy to see that. I will tell a small story. I, I, I remember working with Karen on this program and, and um, uh, pushing to get all these deliverables done and saying, wow, Karen's, you know, she's, she's a good leader because she's driving us really hard. We went out to dinner and went to a steakhouse and one of the uh, waiters came over with a tray full of cocktails. And Karen was having a Chardonnay. I think I was probably having a whatever, a Cabernet. Anyway, that waiter didn't know how to hold the glasses down. It spilled the entire tray full of cocktails all over the table. And Karen, you were just as sweet as pie. I thought I thought there was going to be more uh, more of a uh, <laughs> it was more of a learning experience overall with the with the uh, restaurant. We've been to that restaurant many times. I think that waiter though yeah. was extremely thankful to have have you as a as a customer sitting at the table because uh it went very well and and he was very apologetic but anyway let's get we to got more cocktails and we did get more cocktails that's the great thing about those things they just refill themselves whenever you ask. yeah so, that's true so Karen, let's start, let's start with a little bit of background i i know uh we did a light overview on the introduction on what the american bureau of shipping does you all have been around uh, since 1862. Can you give us a little yeah. background on, on your business? So we're basically a class society for the shipping industry. And it's not the delivery of things. It's the actually build, construct, and sailing of vessels around the world. And we also do um, offshore rigs and that kind of thing. And I liken it to two parts of the business. The first side is if you're going to build a home, you get an architect and that architect has drawings. It takes care of the electricity, the sewage and all of the lighting, <clears throat> all the things that are required. We do the same thing. An owner goes to a shipbuilder to build a vessel and they agree on the type of vessel they're going to build and they start the design of that vessel. Though they have to go through a class society to approve the sailing of that vessel due to insurance and other reasons. We actually came into existence, believe it or not, partly due to the Titanic. That was part of what kind of led to this whole thing. So, um, so if you build according to the plan, so those drawings are sent to ABS and we have to approve them. We have engineers that verify the IMO, International Maritime Laws, around the world that are applied to them. We send those back and forth. As that ship is being built, we then have our surveyors go out and survey that you are actually building to the design and the specifications of that vessel. That's one side of it. The other side is I liken it to every year you get an annual inspection on your car. For a vessel that's sailing, you have annual surveys. And those surveys are dependent on the type of vessel, the type of flag that you're sailing, where you're going to, the type of um, cargo that you're carrying, all of those kinds of things play into that. So that's basically our business. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing because people think of a, of a company like yours and they probably don't understand the global nature of your business overall, nor, nor the uh, amount of people you have spread out over the planet to ensure. We're in we're every safe. major port virtually uh, in the world, you know, obviously not Iran and some of those, but almost sure. every other. Well, great. So let's just push forward and uh, talk about your current role. I know that you you take on a lot of responsibility at ABS. You've got a number of programs going. You have an onshore offshore capacity. You know, give us a little more highlight on, on what Karen does every day. Well, how it started is I was over our corporate applications worldwide, and I griped about data. I griped about data quality. And finally, I think they got tired of hearing about it. So they said, okay, fine, we're going to set up a data governance program. And I made two very important hires. I got two really good people. Uh, one of them is on this call, Jerry, 
who worked on the, um, she basically took this part of it, which is your compliance, your GDPR and everything. And then we've got another one that kind of went the data automation. But when we started, it was just um, governance. And we were starting down that road when, you know, kind of the GDPR started rearing its ugly head. So Jerry and I were already were working with Prolifics because we had some of the uh, tools that they had recommended and were supporting. And we started down that road. And based on the initial findings, we were able to get funding to actually go down this program. This component of data governance and data privacy ended up leading into data automation and really growing my team and data warehouse analytics and reporting. So we've just seen a growth of activity, a growth of interest uh, across the organization, particularly this year in, in light of COVID because everybody needs data. Everybody wants data, you know, because they can't walk down the hall and ask three people to help them. So they're all coming to our group. Right. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit more about the program then. So you know, what, what business challenges did ABS face uh, given the GDPR mandate coming down the pike? Um, well, there's several things. We're a global company. So there's data all over the place. We're an old company and we're very old school. So everybody saves everything everywhere. So the first thing we did, because we were having trouble with getting our unstructured program going, we started with structured data. What you I don't know how many of you are in IT, but in IT, when you implement new systems, when you have an accounting system or an HR system, and you bring other systems into it, like a recruitment system or a talent management system, what you end up having is all of these data flows back and forth, or you create these files. So Jerry was out there one day taking a look, and just by happenstance, she picked a table that we found many, many of our folks, social security numbers, uh, addresses, all sorts of information. Because what would happen is when you create these files, you know, they're temporary files, but temporary files never went away. So that was really an eye-opening experience, especially being from IT, you know, whether it's sloppy or not, that's the way IT in the past worked because we thought it was secure. So that was the first thing is we started in removing this data that was not needed anymore or not in the place it should be and not being used for its intended purpose. So it should be stored and accessed only by the people who have rights to see it. Not me. So. Perfect. Okay, so knowing that that was the challenge, how do prolifics kind of jump in and help you? I know uh, Ron talked about it in a in a deep detail. If you could just bring us up a level for the folks that are uh, listening in, how did how did you get engaged with prolifics beyond the you know the initial tool discussions and really drive out this um, GDPR? So approach? prolifics was our partner initially when we bought our uh, governance tools and all that, right? And you and I actually were the ones talking one day and you said, hey, we can do this assessment for GDPR. And that's how the ball got rolling. And since we already had the tools for structured data, we started looking at tools for unstructured data and we started building out that entire program. Where we have a challenge, we have a lot of offices around the globe, China being one of the biggest ones. We're big in Europe, you know, the, Greece, the Greek uh, ship owners and builders uh, so we have a lot of concerns about GDPR, data privacy. So we took the approach since GDPR is probably one of the most stringent, at least right now, that we're kind of applying those rules across the organization. And so that's that, so our data discovery from an unstructured standpoint started on our SIFs in other parts of the world so that we could reduce that risk. The big glaring piece that we haven't started yet is email, because I think that's one of our biggest risks. 
So that that is in discussions, but we have not started that yet. Okay. All right, let's jump over to the next one. And that's, you know, how did the process and solution that we worked on together help you drive towards compliance? Well, when I showed up to my CIO and said, by the way, I've seen your social security number that got action and attention really quickly. <laughs> so, um, you know, the tools that you guys um, worked with us to pick and then help us implement work. Our team, we've been in a uh, ABS in the shipping industry in general has been really down. So we're very, very, very lean. So Prolifix has been a, a partner with us throughout this whole thing. And I think Jerry would say as well, we've got um, very critical resources on this whole, this, this whole uh, process with us and, and that have helped to make us uh, successful and to identify the risks that ABS has and yeah, continue to do that. Thanks for that, Karen. I know I know that one of the one of the things we did out of the gate was to bring some resources to bear that could move into your offshore offices in India and become part of your team. So that was a way in which we could keep the cost down, but also provide local talent to kind of expand your team and give you give you that on demand set of resources. And I know we've kind of turned the volume up and down on that over the years. Well, that's that's been critical because not only did you help us with um, our dis data discovery, GDPR, data privacy, whatever, you also were critical in the implementation of a, an ex another system where there was data movement, a lot of ETL uh, work. And you guys, I mean, we really beefed up that team over in India. So are we done? That, huh? Are we done? <laughs> done with? Uh, does the work stop there? Sorry, that are we are we finished? Is it ever finished? Not GDPR, not data privacy. It never and not data governance. It never stops. It's just like anything else. You've got to, um, you know, what, what is it? We're actually going through. Let's discover. Let's remediate. Let's go back and discover, right? To see that they remediated and also what new findings they are because. People make mistakes every day. Um, we, we found all sorts of stuff. So, so what? one of the very first things we did when we were just kind of doing a POC to see if we wanted anything, we started looking at, at files in one of our SIFs. And I drilled down. And what we saw is um, because we're an international company, we have invitation letters when people go to other countries. So I drilled into one of my buddies. And the invitation letter had his passport, his age, all sorts of information. So, and that was back in 2003. So it's been sitting out there all that time. Now, his passport has probably changed. He's a whole lot older, but I still had a whole lot of information, date of birth and whatever, that should have been removed years and years before. Okay. Interesting. It's always the data that gets you in trouble. It is. So let's Let's talk a little bit about differences, right? We've got, everyone's concerned about CCPA. We talked about that mandate. The fact of the matter is it's coming down the pike and, and people are gonna have to do something about it. Ron showed us a, a, a diagram of, the, of uh, the United States and all the laws that are coming. I know I've been talking to customers in many different states about CCPA, but, but every other state um, uh, compliance mandate that's coming. Um, you know, based on your, Based on your feedback and what you know, what, what's, what's the difference? I know GDPR is heavier. What's the difference for you between these two? Well, CCPA plays much less of a role for us because it's not near as critical for not-for-profit, which is what we are. We've set the standard for GDPR, but we're big in, we're big in China. We're big in Korea. We're big in the European Union. So, and then we're starting to see uh, mumblings of, uh, and murmurs of restrictions in South America or data privacy laws. So, you know, we established the, the standard as GDPR, but if and as 
laws to particular countries apply, we have the tools that we can actually do that with. Great. So, so basically what you're saying is the fundamental things that are between these policies are, are, are all basically rooted in data and the process to control, secure, and manage that data. So you, you could build upon what you have no matter what country decides they're going to put boxes around your information or controls around it. Yes, and because, you know, in our particular case, we have people around the world. There are some countries that want to know your religion. That's a requirement. Well, in some countries, if you were to put that religion out there, that could cause you a, a big problem. So securing that kind of information and other kinds of information is really, really important. Particularly for us, because we are global in nature. And we have, we, you know, every ethnicity, every whatever you want to say, we probably got it. Sure. No, that makes sense. And I think, I think you already answered this next question, Karen, that we added. Obviously, you know, we, 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 we helped to develop the assessment. Uh, we tailored and tuned that towards ABS. We, we went through the, the interviews, we went through the data scanning and, and put together the processes. Is there anything else that Prolifics helped you with that you want to call out or should we jump to the uh, next one? I, I think Prolifics has been a great partner. Um, if there was an issue and you knew I was upset, you guys immediately tried to jump on it. Uh, and help us get it resolved. So I think that you know that's that's what makes a true team. It's not a us and them. It's how do how are we successful together? And I think that's really important. That too, Brian. On on that point too is is we've always taken the approach, like I said, in the top down method. Is it's not about from prolific's perspective. It's not just about selling software. And so it's helping you understand where your risk is. And doing that as quickly and as, as efficiently and effectively as possible. And again, that's one of the main reasons we, we oftentimes start with the top down because we don't want to just assume as soon as we walk in the door that you're going to need this tool or that tool or this tool or that tool. And we don't just assume that unless you have that's what you do for. But we yeah, I, will, that. Hmm? I will say one of our biggest challenges is getting our executive team to understand the commitment that needs to be made right to this. So, you know, Prolifics has been good in working with us. Um, it's it's kind of funny because just a couple of weeks ago, out of the blue, our chairman wanted to know about our uh, governance component. Well, you know, we've been trying to tell him, Jerry can tell you, we've been trying for two years. And all of a sudden, we were scrambling to send him the policies we put in place, the data quality things that we've done, uh, what we found and what we've cleaned up. So it was kind of funny that out of the blue. And then the next thing is he wanted to know all about the data warehouse. So then I was scrambling, lost electricity, had to drive somewhere where I could get electricity so I could finish that darn presentation for a chairman. So they've got interest now. And they're also realizing how important data quality is, right? So you need to govern it and manage it because at the end of the day, you're trying to gather insights on that data, right? Right. So, and by the way, data is one of a company's most valuable assets, particularly if it's used correctly. And it can be used time and time and over and over again in many different ways. And you can learn and glean new insights and information with that, that, with that data. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent point. I think when when people um, you know think about compliance, they think about rushing to the finish line or meeting an, uh, regulators' uh, requirements or checking the box, and they don't really think about the uh, consumability of knowing your data better and using that for downstream applications, better customer care, better data assessments, better reporting, better financial trans transactional reporting. You know, people tend to just look at it as this this box of compliance is making me do something, not the what else can I do with it until they get through it. I, I think that's true, but it's also the other thing. When I was uh, presenting budget last year, so the chairman and the president both looked at me and said, oh, so you'll be done after this. No, this is a program. 
just like data security for, or security into your systems, it doesn't go away. You have to continually monitor, remediate, monitor, remediate, improve, right? So it never stops. Right. You're, you're right. securing one of your biggest assets within the company. Right. And we we actually class Navy ships and all that. So we also have to make sure that data is secure. Right. So you start getting into DFARS and all that kind of stuff, which leads me to some of the tools that we purchased. If we have to do, look at uh, CUI data and some of the other things, we have some of the tools that could actually apply those rules. We could they could give us the rules that we could then do discovery and apply those rules to identify those um, files or whatever that have that kind of data in it. That was Excellent. actually brought up this morning, Ron, in case you want to know. <laughs> uh, well, Karen, I promise this is the last question and we'll let the folks out there uh, pile on any questions they want. It's not uh, what kind of wine do you have in your glass? I'm assuming it's Chardonnay. I think I know you well enough. Uh, oh, I can't it's wait. Sauvignon Blanc, remember? Oh, you know what? I knew that from yesterday. We both moved on to Sauvignon Blanc. So, so cheers, cheers to your Sauvignon Blanc. Um, here's the final question. You know, I think you've gone through like the tactical, the, the, the process benefits, but I also think you hit on the, the long-term benefits. But at a high level, what is, what is the biggest benefit that, that ABS would receive from having gone through this other than the obvious? Well, I think there's a couple. Obviously, we're identifying reducing our risk, but also I think it's with your customers because if they know you have a program, you know, we don't handle as much data as a lot of companies. We still handle people's uh, personal information and particularly some of the board members and some of our Greek owners and different things around the world, other owners around the world. They feel confident or much more confident knowing that we're responsible with our data, right? From a security perspective, from a privacy perspective, from a management perspective, and that, that, that we don't share it and give it to people and use it in an unintended way. So it's respecting that ability and being able to um, partner with your customers and they have uh, complete confidence that you're doing what's best for them. Perfect. Thank you, Karen. I, I'm going to move over to the audience participation portion of this. We've, uh, we've got a few questions in the chat. I will throw them out to you. Uh, the first one comes in from uh, Mark Petronic, and he's asking about the chances for data governance. Uh, what are the chances for success with data governance when you have to work mostly in a bottoms-up fashion without a strong executive top-down mandate? And I think, I think you did hit on the top-down, so you can just round that out. We We've got the same challenge. Um, we pulled our hair out, right? I mean, we put together, uh, we worked with prolifics, but we put together an overall program. We set up committees. Um, we did all of that information. We did a maturity model and they were implementing this huge system last year. So for two years, we've been brushed off. <laughs> Two weeks ago or three weeks ago, all of a sudden, they're asking all these questions because data is important. So I, I, I share your pain. Um, what I would say is move forward. Um, one of the things we did is we did a, a couple of newsletters that we sent out to the company. But uh, it's something we should probably revisit again, starting to make people aware, right? Um, it's it's a slow and and sometimes painful process, but we seem to be making some strides in that. So document, have it at the touch of a finger. So if you need to send it, uh, you can show your progress. Excellent. Next one uh, for you, Karen, comes from Tim. Uh, Tim's asking, how quickly did you realize value from the work effort? Have you deployed from what effort the work effort overall the program how quickly did you see value i i think <laughs> the day jerry walked in my office and said karen you're not going to believe what i just found and then i 
my my CIO was traveling and the next week she was back and we were coming out of a meeting. I just reached over and I said, by the way, I've got a whole lot of social security numbers. And she's like, you got to get rid of that. But the biggest eye opening thing I think for me is, you know, we in IT tend to be a little arrogant, right? We think everybody else is sloppy and we're responsible. Of course. IT, we had a whole lot of data out there in temporary tables that we didn't take care of. And it's just the way you did things. You didn't go back and clean up. So, you know, don't throw stones at your glass house when you haven't cleaned your own. So that's the biggest eye opener for me. Very good point. And the last one I, I'll ask you, I think this goes back to less of the program and more about yourself. And it probably applies to Jerry as well and your overall team. And that's how did you go about learning, you know, the very wide and deep subject of data governance? How did you evolve, immerse and educate yourself in this? as you were pushing this program? You gotta have a passion, right? And I have a very strong team and um, I don't have, in my opinion, a weak link on my team. And so Jerry has a passion for um, understanding and implementing a process just like um, I think the rest of us do. So if you don't have that passion, it makes it, harder because you it's more than just doing a b and c and implementing it's communicating with others it's getting buy-in with your legal team it's getting buy-in with the executives albeit very painful and slow sometimes because at the end of the day you're an overhead cost so you have to put it in a perspective that what is the risk to abs if we don't comply what are the potential dollar values that could hurt us? What is the potential? Because we're not like a target. If they have a breach, you know, you lose 10,000 customers, you still got hundreds of thousands more. You know, if we lose several owners, it could really hit our business. So it's understanding that risk and trying to deal with it. Excellent. Well, I will say on behalf of all of us, Karen, cheers to you and your team. I appreciate you joining us today. I know, uh, cheers. I know it's, uh, it's, all, it's weird being virtual. I can't wait to see you in Houston in person again or whenever we can get somewhere else other than uh, being little squares <laughs> on a screen. So, so thank you again. And uh, thank you to everyone that's joined us. I appreciate your, uh, your coming out to talk to us. If you have any compliance questions, this is our, our email address here, solutions at prolifics. We're going to be hosting many more digital events. Again, uh, we appreciate you taking the time with us today. Have a great rest of your day and cheers to you all as well. Thank you. Thanks, cheers. Everyone. Take care.